just black and white and got things on a board, don't you think? What if we went outside when we left out of church and everything was just black and white? <coughs>
crayons just for me. I took the box, I opened it up, and I looked way down inside. Those colors, they reminded me of Jesus when he died. Oh,
that long. We might be calling on you to clean that one again this week. Yeah. <coughs> Turn in your Bible with the second Chronicles chapter 7. Uh, just to let you know, we do have a special singing tonight. We got one of our own youth that's going to sing for a special. We'll be empty prayer, Brother Justin. We also, uh, Wednesday night, we're going to have uh, Living by Faith. It's the group that my daughter is in. We're going to be singing. Thursday night, we're going to have Joe Bluer. Come and sing for us. Uh, special choir events on the other two nights, Monday and Tuesday night. Remember all these uh, various things. Let's remember our speaker of the hour, which is my cousin. But again, I would say, I uh, hope we're going to have revival. You know, as I asked the young people this morning, I'm enjoying that class this Sunday morning. I'm finding out what they think. But you know what? It's hard to get them to talk. Can you imagine in just a few years they're going to be teenagers and not going to be able to get them to hug? Yeah. Wow. I got it. You know what I'm <laughs> uh, no, our teenagers are wonderful groups of people. They really are. I appreciate them so much. They do talk. I'm glad they will talk to you. Uh, but seriously, pray for our. Uh, new member class. It's an important class. I think our children are learning. May I please ask you, parents, please, please, please work with them and allow them to put down their feelings. As uh, to, I want to know what they are thinking. I want to know how they feel about the scripture. I want to know that they understand what they're reading. And the better way to do it is to let them write down what, what's your feeling. <coughs> It's not necessarily a right or wrong, or definitely not crazy. And uh, I showed, I tried to show them this week, that their thought is important. We need to understand these questions. All right, here in the book of uh, Second Chronicles 7 and verses uh, 12, we'll read 12, 13, 14 as we stand together for the reading of God's Word. When we get to verse 14, I'd like you all to read along with me. I'm going to read verses 12 and 13, and I'd like you to read 14 with me. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an hour of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Would you pray? Almighty God, I pray as we have read this verse 14 in unison together, God, we realize that we all stand in need of your forgiveness. Morning. God, we are not, not perfect. We stand in need, dear Lord, today of you cleansing us. But God, we first must recognize that we need cleansing. God, we must recognize this morning, Lord, that you're standing with outstretched arms saying, come with me. All you that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God, there's one in our midst today that know you not and is pardoning. Forgive us of sin. I pray for a movement of the Holy Ghost as you touch them this morning. Father, there's one here today. It's not where they ought to be with you. And God, they need a closer walk. I pray in invitation time, dear God. And even before then, if you direct me so, don't let us direct what you want, God. But what you want will be right. God, let us respond to your call. God, bless it all now in the precious name of Jesus. For our Lord, Lord and Jesus, Savior's name. Amen. May be seated. There again, I'm not trying to make an excuse none at all. But if I sometimes... Grimace or either sometimes don't sound like I'm saying what I ought to say. I don't mean not to. Honestly, it's hard to speak when you have to hear yourself. <laughs> Y'all ought to got eight million out of that. <laughs> Y'all have to listen to me all the time, but I'm having to listen to myself this morning. <laughs> Terrible. But here, as God was revealing something to Solomon, we 
know him being David's son, how did he knew how to love God. He had uh, promised God that he would build a sanctuary that's greater than it had ever been. And I want you this morning to look at yourselves in a mirror-like image this morning and realize that God has thought you to be a greater and a more beautiful dwelling place than the temple in Solomon. You are the dwelling place of God, the Holy Spirit. You are the one that God says, I'd like to take my dwelling with you. Not in a man's uh, brick temple somewhere. Why, if it were to be so, everybody in the world would try to move wherever that building was. But why the the whole population of the world, believing in God, would move to that one area. But see, I'm glad today that God is everywhere present and nowhere else. Amen. I'm glad that he could be with you and be with me at the same time. I had someone to ask me uh, recently to try to explain the Trinity. And I've been studying that out, and the only answer that I can come up with trying to explain the Trinity to someone that don't know anything about it is God is God in that that Him, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Here it is, people. Here it is. They are three being one. Not any of us can think the same thing at the same time. Not any two of us, much less three of us, can be in the same place at the same time. But the triune Godhead thinks the same thing all the time. And the triune Godhead is at the presence. They're all at one dwelling place at all times. Amen. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. That's not there to try and God is. I can't explain it any differently than that to you. I, I try to figure out how to explain the Trinity. And I've asked a brother of mine, and a much more Bible study than me, he said, Preacher, I can't explain what you want. I cannot identify tell what the Scripture says and we believe it. But listen to me. I, I said all that to say this. God is, is uh, saying today when he's talking to Solomon, and look what he said in verse 12. He said, The Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said unto him, listen to this, I have heard thy prayer. I want you to know that God hears thy prayer. Amen. And the Bible said that he said, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Now folks, I don't know about you this morning, but it makes me feel good to know that God don't mind dwelling in Jimmy Floyd. Amen. I'm glad this morning, it's not of my goodness, but it's of his forgiveness. But also it gives me a greater understanding of my responsibility. I have tried to teach them young people this morning and then last week and trying to tell them now uh, that they are the dwelling place of God. And as becoming a Christian, it makes you to be a new creature in Christ. Folks, I'm afraid today that sometimes we as older Christians don't understand that we are the dwelling place of God. Folks, I tell you, sometimes... We go some places and do some things and say some things that I don't think we think God's with us. Can I get amen? amen? I don't think God, I think if we really thought God was with us, we wouldn't say some of the things we say. If we thought God was with us, we wouldn't go some of the places that we go. If we thought God was with us, we'd be scared not to be in the house of God at the appointed time. But I want to tell you today, uh, our society has lost the reverential fear of God. Uh -huh. The Bible says, when he told the Solomon by night, he said, I have heard thy prayer. Many times we pray, God save my child. God save my brother. God save my wife, my husband. Save my sister. God save my dad, my mom. Well, if we really want God to save them, then we need to be living in such a way that they see God in us. Amen. They need to be seen that we are the example there of leading them to Christ. Many times our children, our grandchildren, uh, many times they're our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our dads, and some say, I had that young lad just a week or so ago uh, to put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Preacher, will you pray for my dad? He is unsaved. Friend, I want to tell you, I believe that young man is trying to present the best example he can to his dad. He goes to church on a regular basis. 
I haven't heard of him being any type of trouble. I've been around him when he's been away from church. I haven't heard any foul language come out of his mouth. I want to tell you this morning, friend, uh, there, but we sometimes we are confusing people by our, our actions. Amen. Amen. Hey, did y'all, I apologize for having to hold that ear. It's just radiant so that I can't understand it. Listen, the Bible says, when God uh, looked there at Solomon, and he says, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Folks, I want to tell you this morning, that God sometimes will cause things to come upon our life to get our attention. God will allow circumstances to change in our life to get our attention. I have had calls there as a pastor uh, there to the hospital when the mom and dad is tore up. Mom and dad crying. Oh, my baby, my baby has been in a wreck. Oh, I've been there when they call me into the home. My child has gotten in this trouble or that trouble. I've been called there by a wife of saying how to her a husband is not treating her proper uh, over the years. Folks, I want to tell you today, sometimes things happen to get our attention. You don't want God to have to holler at us. Folks, we just need to respond to the will of God and the call of God when He says, all oh, you need every labor, come unto me and I will give you rest. God asks us to repent of our sin. He said unto Solomon, Solomon, if I decide, to shut up the windows of heaven that there be no rain. We don't know what that is very much here in South Carolina, but we've experienced, experienced a pretty good bit of it this year. We're living right short of rain right now. You know why we don't pay any attention to it? We don't farm anymore here. If you were out in Texas and had three years of drought like the Texans have out there, you'd have yourself on an altar somewhere crying out to Almighty God. Our problem here in South Carolina is that we depend upon tourism and if something happens to our coast and there comes a hurricane on our coast and we don't have any more tourism, we're going to be crying out to God. Amen. God can get our attention. Amen. But he said, to the people of God, if I shut up heaven, that there be no more rain, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. He said in verse 14, he didn't ask for the world to repent. He don't ask for those that are living in the world to repent. He don't ask for them to come and make a difference in the house of God as far as having revival. That's not God is saying, if my people, he's talking about Christians. He's talking about born again believers. God don't ask the world to come and tithe at the house of God. God asks his people to tithe at the house of God. God, God doesn't require the world to support the ministry of carrying on the kingdom work throughout the world. He has his people to do that. Folks, we ought to feel responsible because Jesus died for our sins. Amen. Amen. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. You know that right there is a problem in our society today. It's hard to get people to get on. We don't get on until we get scared. We don't get on until we get hurt, until we get hungry. We don't get on even now in the face of a financial tragedy in society. We're not humble. We're not humble. We're crying out to God. God, you give it to me all my life. Why aren't you still giving it to me? It's because we don't deserve it. Amen. I can remember back on you. There's some of you old gray headed people can remember what I'm about to tell you. I can remember back on you when you were looking toward mom and daddy and and especially daddy, I got 15 years old and I got my license. Actually, I was 14 when I got my license. It was a dangerous society, but they give them to me. <laughs> I got my license and I asked dad, could I borrow a car? And he said, when I don't want to you, you can borrow a car. If you do right, if you back in on time, if you make good grades. But when it comes time for me to buy a car, I didn't stick my hand out to mom and dad and say, you owe me a car. Mom and daddy said, if you want a car, you work for it. Folks, we are ruining our children by not making them work for nothing. We are just letting them uh, feel that we owe them a vehicle. We owe them a college education. Listen, I think every child should go to college. And if a child will go to college today with all these things that's available, I tell you, it's their own fault. Because we've got so many things available there through all this taxes thing and 
the lottery thing and all these scholarships is available. If a child won't go to college today, even to tech, if not to a four-year college, it's their own fault. In the day when I come up, if you didn't go to college, maybe it's because mom and daddy couldn't afford to send you, and that might be a reality. Amen. A lot of people went to college and worked, and they, they worked their way through college. But we're ruining our children today because we're not teaching them how to be humble. They have boldly walk up to you and, I want my car, please. Hey, we're making them like that. We don't need to blame nobody else. You walk to a mirror somewhere and look for yourself. We're the ones that caused it. Hey, grandmas, grandpas, we're as bad as the moms and dads. Moms and dads, that's a good place for you to say amen. <laughs> grandmas and grandpas is the world's worst. For let the little fella have what he needs. Everybody else has got a car. I don't want him to go around without having a shiny new truck with a thousand dollar set of rims and tires on it. You've got to keep him looking cool. Let me tell you what, what you are to do, you are to teach him the word of God. And hey, come back up here. Tell me when you read God's word all through and through, come back and we'll talk about maybe uh, trying to work something out with you. Put some restrictions there. There need to be some limits to our children today. That's why our children are learning not to be committed to God. We're not requiring it. We're not requiring it. My mom and dad didn't take me to church. But my wife, where is she at? She's sitting right there. She'll tell you. We took our children to church. We didn't send them to church. We took them to church. You say, well, you're a preacher. I wasn't a preacher when they were growing up as young. I didn't start preaching until I was 37 years old. And my, I, we had already pretty much raised our children up. We, they were born early for us there. We were a young married couple. We had our children early. They were on up in their years. I know they were not grown young ones, but they were pretty much up. But we took them to church. We actually saw that they were involved in church activity. We didn't send them. If mom and dad weren't there, that it was a mistake where they were, we were sick or something probably in them. And I'm not trying to pat us on the back. I'm just saying that was our commitment to our children. Amen. You think it's then, folks. Listen to me. Listen to me, parents. I want revival so bad this week I don't know what to do. Let me go ahead and tell you. It's then when you look in your children's eyes and say they ought to be in church when you ain't there with them. Amen. That's then stuff. They see right through that. They see that you're not committed, they're not going to be committed either. Amen. They see that you out here doing other stuff. You're going to probably not like it there. You might have a, a pastor calling right shortly. But I'm not going to uh, change God's word. The Bible tells us we need to present ourselves to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Amen. Not to our own ideas, but to God's ideas Amen. of what a Christian ought to be. Amen. If my people, which are called by my name, Shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Seek in the face of God. How many times do we pray? Maybe last three minutes. Don't even have time to get to the face of God. Don't even have time to talk about what we really need to talk about. I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake. I pray the Lord my soul to take me and good night. Right. That's what our children hear is pray. I'm asking these children to dismiss us with prayer in class on Sunday morning. I am very proud <coughs> that two already have dismissed us in prayer. And I'm going to go around that table and each one of them dismiss somewhere over the next 10 weeks, 8 weeks. They're going to dismiss. You can tell where a child is learning to pray or not at home. You can tell where a child is used to praying or not. Parents, they, sometimes they don't know how to pray because they haven't heard us pray. Amen. My wife and I, I told her in our later years as our children got larger, older, grown, or whatever you want to say, older. I said, baby, one thing I regret is not having family devotion as I should have, as the leader of the home. I apologize to my family for that. They knew Daddy was saved. They knew that Daddy prayed. They heard Daddy pray. They heard Mama pray. We taught God's Word, but there's something about having that family devotion that 
makes it better. Amen. Why did I have to wait till I was middle aged to learn that? I don't know. Moms, dads, you're missing a good opportunity. And let your children express themselves. Let them learn what it is to talk about the God that they serve. Folks, we're so, and we're in such a religious society that people don't really know what they believe or if they believe anything. They get up and go to church on Sunday morning. They may or may not go on Sunday night and more than likely won't go on Wednesday night. And that's what they call church. Folks, in just a few hours you see and pay here during the week, that is not all the church you should have. Church should be every day, all day. I saw Grady this past week. We met down there at the meeting place of Conwayites. Out of limits. We met there over and played us up to eat. And over in that conversation, we had some conversation about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Folks, it ought to be your conversation. You say, well, Jimmy, that's fanatic. <coughs> Folks, I was going to say, how do you not talk about Jesus knowing what he's done for you? How do you not talk about the love of God knowing that he can give you breath of life? How do you not talk about God? when he saved your soul from hell. But folks, really, if that's the only thing I was concerned about, that he saved you from hell, I've missed the good point of knowing that living for him is a gracious way of life. We're losing it. He said, it's my people. But you call them my name. themselves and pray. And seek my face. Listen to the next section. And turn from their wicked ways. Now church members don't like to be called if they're done wicked ways. But friend, I want to tell you, anything that's contrary to the will of God is a wicked way. Amen. Anything you put before the work of God is a wicked way. And no matter what it is, we're living in a reparation society. You can acknowledge that, leave it alone, don't make no difference. We're living in a reparation society. And it ain't just started. It started back young we were raising our young. We done the same thing. We like to do the same things. But listen, my wife will tell you before that she was even saved, and she was right in the boat with her husband, that if we went out anywhere, we came back at the house of God at the appointed time. If we had to drive 30 miles one way to get there, we did that to recognize our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, it's all about your decision and what you're doing with your commitment to God. Amen. Being wicked also. Is overspending, not being able. I'm trying to teach these young children here about how, what it is to tithe. Moms and dads, I hope y'all help me. Don't just give them a dollar to give to the church. Teach them to tithe. Teach them to tithe. I mean, we had a fundraiser last night down at City of uh down at uh, uh, the landmark, and and I would like one thing that O'Neill Miller said. O'Neill Miller said, I don't want you to take from your time. This is not about you taking. He said, if I were to tell you tonight to take from your time that you're supposed to give to the, the storehouse, I'd be looking for God to strike a bolt of lightning in this room right now. He said, what you give the CEF needs to give above and beyond your time. Your time is responsible to the uh, house of God. And folks, it's not our uh, option, it's God's requirement. But our children have not learned that from us. Just like they haven't learned other things. Perhaps you'd be a mighty heartless this morning. The Bible said to turn from their wicked ways. He weren't talking about the world, he was talking about his people. Amen. He weren't talking about a drunkard, he weren't talking about a murderer, he was talking about a Christian. Amen. He said, and turn from their wicked way. Then, listen to this. Oh, I love you. He says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know, I've heard some Christians say over the years that since I've been saved, I've never seen it. They've lied. They know the way of saying it. They've lied. There's no way possible you can live that perfect. If Jesus had to buy out in the Garden of Eden, and he didn't want to have to go to that cross of Calvary, if Jesus had to buy out in the Garden of Eden, and
and shed there. As the Bible says that his tears and his sweat was as great drops of blood. If he had to bow with that altar, folks, I need to lie prostrate. I don't even need to bow. I need to lie prostrate on the floor and not even look up. For he knew no sin, but I am sin. And so are you. Folks, we need to commit ourselves to God today. He said he would forgive their sin and will heal their land. Folks, if we've ever needed a healing in America, we need it today. Amen. I was glad last night Tim uh, Scott, came down, uh, Rep. Senator, came down and spoke to us. And I'm glad to say this was a man that was proud to say he was a born-again Christian. I'm glad to say that he was uh, reflective of sin. He was proud that CEF had a movement of putting the gospel in our schools. And he was proud of it and supportive of it and gave of his financial uh, need there to be uh, help be a part of the support of it. Folks, I want to tell you today, I'm glad we've got a few representatives that still want to see the Ten Commandments on the walls of our justice building. I'm glad today that we have such as that going on. Folks, there are many of us today that won't take the stand that needs to be to where we stand and require uh, our people that are working for us. We have allowed them to go to Washington and make laws that is taken away from the very word of God and we sit down and do nothing about it. It's our fault. Amen. It is us that's allowed this. We can stop it. Then he said down in verse, and I'm not going to read all of what's up here in front of me now because Brother Jerry's got there. I told him I would like for her to be up here. He says in verse 15, Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Now you were thinking here about Solomon's temple. But I want to tell you, you are the temple of God today. And God, listen to this, it says, now mine eyes shall be open, and mine ears attend unto, that, unto the prayer that is made in this place. God hears your prayer when you pray I want you to feel a personal contact with God today. That God hears your prayer. Now listen to me, young person, especially young person. But now some old people are just as, uh, 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 I'm trying to choose the right words on everybody's feelings. I mean, it's not right for me to ask for a million dollars. It's not right for me to ask God to grow hair on my head. The people are there to get that. It's not right for God to ask me to give me a new vehicle to sit in a parking lot. If I want, I need to work for it. That that we can do for ourselves, we should do for ourselves. Amen. I was teaching the children in class this morning that living a Christian life is not a point but a process. We need to understand that being a Christian, you don't say, well, I got saved on such and such a day, I don't never have to do nothing else. Why, if we'd be like that, We'd be like we, we were born on our birthday and never grew up. Amen. Folks, I want to tell you today, we need to understand today, God don't want us to pray frivolous prayers about things that are unimportant. I mean, we shouldn't pray and ask for, I don't know, I want to be the captain of the ball team. If you want to be the captain of the ball team, get out and earn it, work for it. Amen. Play the team proper, exercise, be the best available pick. That's the way you become a captain of football team. Those things should not necessarily be prayed about except asking God to give you the energy and the ability and the desire to be successful. Those things are all right to ask God. But God hears our prayer. Our prayer should not be frivolous. Our prayer should be definite about things that God wants us to have. We shouldn't ask God for things that we know that God doesn't want us to have. Amen. We should not ask Him for that. We should not ask Him for success. Maybe we're not equipped to handle success. We should not ask Him how to be a foot taller. I mean, I, when, I, when I stand beside Stephen Winston, I feel just about like a, a little short fellow up here with John I mean, you know, I look up at him and I back off like this and see as you see him. I mean, you know, I'm this serious. God made him tall for a reason. He wanted him to be tall. See, I'm not talking about your stature and being negative. I'm just saying God loves both of us the same amount. Just because he made you taller, don't make him that he loves Stephen better than he loves Jimmy. He loves me just as much. I'm proud to be short and bald-headed. I ain't proud to be fat. That's my fault. 
but I'm proud to be short and bald headed. God made me that way. Be proud of whom that you are. God made you that way. God is proud of you. You are His temple. Treat Him as such. Treat Him as such. Some of you have a belt that you haven't even used yet. And the hair is gray. You've got things you can do for God that you've left undone. Present yourself to be a living sacrifice. Holy. Acceptable unto Him, which is your reasonable service. It's what the Bible says. We don't do the remaining verses if you would. I'm not going to address into that. Folks, I think the main thing that we need to understand today that we are the temple of God. And we need to treat God's temple better than what we've been doing. We need to bring God's temple to the house of God. We need to be a representative here this week at this revival time. You need to have asked some of your neighbors to come and be here at revival time. You need to have asked your uh, fellow workmen there to come here. It's revival time. You need to ask that person down at the local uh, Minute Mark or at McDonald's. It's unsafe. You need to say, it's revival time. Preacher, they're working. Or well, maybe they can come on a night when they're not working. Folks, we need to be spreading revival time. But folks, I want the old good deal to have revival.